I ran across a story. This is a story out of NPR. NPR broke this story, and I just I wanted to, I thought I'd leave it today on a you know really just a heartwarming note. There, this is about a young kid who was in a coma, who was basically in a vegetative state. And I'll just read for you a little bit from the article here. Is that it was the late 1980s, and young Martin Pistorius, growing up in South Africa, was most likely thinking about electronics, resistors and transistors, and you name it. But at age 12, his life took an unexpected turn. He came down with a strange illness. The doctors weren't sure what it was, but their best guess was cryptococcal meningitis. He got progressively worse. Eventually, he lost his ability to move by himself his ability to make eye contact, and then, finally, his ability to speak. His parents, Rodney and Joan, were told that he was as good as not there, a vegetable. The hospital told them to take him home and to keep him comfortable until he died. But he didn't die. Martin just kept going, just kept going, his mother said. His father would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and get him dressed, load him in the car, take him to a special care center where he'd leave him. Eight hours later, they'd pick him up, bathe him, feed him, put him in bed, set the alarm for two hours so that they could wake up and turn him so that he didn't get bed sores, Rodney said. That was their life. That was their lives for 12 years. Joan, his mother, vividly remembers looking at Martin one day and saying, I hope you die. I know that's horrible to say, she says now. I just wanted some sort of relief. And she didn't think that her son was there to hear it. But he was. Yes, I was there. Not from the very beginning, but for about two years into my vegetative state, began to wake up, says Martin, now 39 and living in Harlow, England. He thinks he began to wake up somewhere around the age of 14 or 15 years old. I was aware of everything, just like a normal person, Martin says. But although he could see and understand everything, he couldn't move his body. Everyone was so used to me not being there that they didn't notice when I began to present, uh, began to become present again. The stark reality hit me that I was going to spend the rest of my life like that, totally alone. He was trapped with only his thoughts for company, and they weren't particularly nice thoughts. No one will ever show me. No one would ever show me tenderness. No one will ever love me. And of course, there was no way to escape his thought. You are doomed. So he figured his only option was to leave his thoughts behind. And that was my first strategy, strategy, disengaging his thoughts. And he said he got really good at it. I don't really think, you don't really think about anything, Martin says. You simply exist. It's a very dark place to find yourself because, in a sense, you're allowing yourself to vanish. But occasionally there were little things that elicited thoughts that he could not ignore. He said, like Barney. One of the things he talks about is how at the center that he used to go to, they used to play Barney all day long. And he said, I hated Barney with a passion. So tired of listening to Barney. But I want you to think for a moment about this young man, 14, 15 years old, all of a sudden wakes up, can't move, can't move his eyes, completely paralyzed, but 100% aware of everything going on around him. And no one hugs you. No one tells you they love you. No one shows you affection. No one even pretends that you're there. And for years, you go on. Your own mother tells you she just wishes you would die. the strength and the resolve that that young man had, the mental torture, the prison that he was locked away in, was just undescribable, unimaginable, the pain that he was going through. Then one day he decided that he'd had enough. He wanted to gain some small measure of control over his day. So he figured out how to tell time by how the sun moved across the room. And that was the start. Eventually, Martin found a way to reframe even the ugliest thoughts that haunted him, like when his mother said, I want you to die. 
the rest of the world felt so far away when she said those words, Martin said, but he began to wrestle with it. Why would my mother say that? As time passed, I gradually learned to understand my mother's uh, desperate situation. Every time she looked at me, she could see only a cruel parody of a once healthy child she had loved so much. Over time, Martin began to re-engage with his thoughts. And slowly, as his mind felt better, something else happened. His body began to get better too. It involved inexplicable neurological developments and a painstaking battle to prove that he existed. And guys, I've already sent a note to Kevin. I'm going to try and get him on the show. I would absolutely love to hear his story. He has a book out. His name is, Darren, see if you can find the book. His name is Martin Pistorius. And that's P-I-S-T-O-R-I-U-S. Just talking about his life and his struggle. And I'm sorry I don't have the, uh, the book right here. Let me see if I can find it. The book is called Ghost Boy, Ghost. My Escape from a Life Locked Inside My Own Body. We will link to that on the YouTube, on the, at jasonstapleton.com so that those of you who want to get at it can go and, and, and purchase the book. But, ah, oh, what a story. What an incredible... I mean, the guy lived a life trapped inside of his own body, but what an, in, what an incredible life. What an incredible story. You can actually go to martinpistorius.com. He's actually got a whole site built. Uh, martinpistorius.com? Yeah. Okay. bring it up here. We'll link. We, there okay. it is. Ghost Boy. I am going to read this book, by the way. I'm, I'm fascinated with this, mainly because of the, the mental struggle. I mean, imagine if you were just, you were literally tied down, couldn't move your head, couldn't move your eyes, your hands, nothing, paralyzed from the top of your head to your feet. And everyone around you thought you were dead. You were nothing but a burden. No one hugged you. No one said, I love you. No one said, hey, let me tell you about my day. Let me show you this. How you doing? Nothing. Just locked away. I'm so interested to hear that story and to read that book. But anyway, Mar I, I, I wanted to leave you with that because it is, even though it's kind of sad, the story has a great happy ending. Now, that's not normally the way I look at things. My wife would tell me, because at Little House on the Prairie is something that we watch a lot of reruns around our house, mm -hmm. and every single one of them, somebody goes blind. It's just, it's absolute misery for 47 minutes or for 57 minutes, and then the last three minutes, everything ends up being okay. And my wife always says, well, it ends up, the story ends up being really nice. It ends up being a really good story. I'm like, no, it was a terrible story. It was a depressing story. It's just they managed to loop it around and make it okay at the end. So normally I'm not totally into that, but this just, this is really an incredible and inspiring story of someone overcoming a massive amount of adversity in his life. It's an incredible story about the resiliency of the human body. And I, I, it makes me wonder... And the, the yeah. mind as much as the body. And it makes me wonder how his experience and him detailing in the book is going to have an effect on the way medical treatment is issued to these type of people. Because you wonder if, if it happened to him, it could have happened to other people. And so you just kind of wonder how that's going to affect the whole industry. It's definitely going to change the way every single parent should look at a child who you know, modern science says isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know a lot of people don't listen to that anyway, but I, there, the, I've always said if something like if my child had an issue like that, that, that I would, um, that I would never lose hope that they would come back. Uh, but this is absolutely reassuring evidence mm -hmm. that man, you just, you can't ever give up. You never know what's happening. And here was a kid. I want to know, it doesn't say in the article, I want to know how, when he actually began to be able to communicate again. He's 39 years old now, but what, you know, how old was he when he started? And I know I'm running long here, guys. I got to get out of here, but and we could talk about this more. We're going to try and get him on the show. I just, I'm so impressed with him and with his story.